So welcome. Um, could you hear me? Okay. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, panel on new monetary policy frameworks. Why now? Uh, this is a very timely topic. It's always a timely topic, but in these days it's even more uh, timely because of uh, various events that are going uh, of, uh, on in the world, and not only in the US, but in the world. And uh, I'm sure we will talk more about this uh, throughout this uh, panel. So first of all, I would like to introduce uh, the speakers and, uh, the, uh, uh, and, the, and the discussants. And then uh, uh, I will ask President Barkin to give initial remarks, then uh, Governor uh, Raskin, and then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Schubert. And then uh, uh, my colleague Lawrence Baxter, Professor Baxter, will ask the first question, and we will start a conversation, and then we will open the floor to, um, for questions. Uh, so, first of all, I'm Giovanni Zanalda, the director of the Duke Center for International Global Studies. My interest in this area is I, I teach a course on financial crisis, and I've always been interested, of course, in monetary policy. And, uh, and uh, so I, when we start talking about this uh, panel, it was a long time ago, probably a year ago, but uh, I thought, well, at the <coughs> time it was a timely topic, but as I said, today is even more timely. So we didn't miss any uh, opportunity, I would say. And I would like to say thank you to, to uh, President Barkin for having accepted this uh, invitation. Uh, and we work uh, around the schedule, so we are happy to uh, have him here. And also thank you to uh, Governor Raskin for having accepted the invitation. I know she's very busy, and, um, and uh, so having her expertise both as a former <laughs> Uh, member of the Fed and the Treasury, and now as a scholar, is uh, certainly very important for us. And then uh, I would say thank you very much to Dr. Schubert, who just flew in from uh, Austria uh, yesterday. And uh, although yesterday you went to another, no, on Monday, you went to another um, important, uh, uh, not panel, but that was a, a sort of <laughs> conference, <laughs> if you want to. And uh, so thank you very much for being here. And uh, he uh, certainly brings a different perspective. So it's from the European side, so ECB. There are, room, there are seats in front, please, please you can use it. And uh, so let me just introduce um, the three speakers. Uh, Tom Barkin uh, is the president and chief ex executive officer of the Richmond Fed. He joined the Richmond Fed in January 2018. In this role, is responsible for the bank's monetary policy, bank supervision and regulation, and payment services, al as well as oversight of all the Federal Reserve System's information technology organization. Uh, Barkin served as a voting member in 2018 on the Federal Reserve's chief monetary policy body, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee. That, as we know, it's, it's an important committee. <laughs> Um, prior to joining the Richmond Fed, uh, Barkin was a senior partner and chief financial officer at McKinsey. Uh, he also served on the board of director, directors for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta from 2009 to 2014 and was the board chairman from 2013 to 2014. He's a member of the Emory University Board of Trustees and the Greater Washington Partnership. Uh, Barkin earned his BA, Master, and Law degrees uh, from Harvard University, where he's going tomorrow for another talk, I think. So you are going back to your alma mater. And um, Governor uh, Raskin, Sarah Bloom Raskin, is the former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury uh, and uh, former Governor of the Federal Reserve Board. And is ca she's currently Rubenstein, a Rubenstein Fellow here at Duke. Um, as a Rubenstein Fellow, Governor Raskin works closely with various units, uh, including the Global Financial Market Center at the Duke Law School, here represented by his faculty director, Professor Baxter. Uh, Governor Baskin, Banskin, Raskin, sorry, she's a leading, <laughs> sorry, I mixed up <laughs> the two names. <laughs> Governor Raskin uh, is a leading, uh, uh, she's leading a research agenda that seeks to shape a new relationship between regulation and resilience in financial markets. And she's also exploring opportunity, opportunities to harness cyber data and turn it into a public asset rather than a liability. She, all, she holds a JD from Harvard Law School and BA in economics from Ham Amherst College. Dr. Schubert, Oral Schubert, is a former Director General of the European Central Bank Statistics Department. Uh, 
Uh, he was also chairman of the Statistics Committee of the European System of Central Banks and chairman of the Contact Group on Data, so again, data, of the European Systemic Risk Board, co-chair of the European Statistical Forum and vice chairman of the Irving Fisher Committee on Central Bank Statistics. Uh, he worked for 25 years at the National Bank of Austria and 13 years as Director of Statistics. Mm -hmm. He has been member of several Austrian and European statistical bodies. So for those who are studying econometrics, please don't challenge him. <laughs> <laughs> He's an honorary professor of, econ for economi of economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. He's the author of several books and articles on central banking, European monetary policy, statistics and monetary history. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of South Carolina and a master's degree in business administration from the Vienna University of Economics and Business uh, in uh, Austria, of course. Professor Baxter is the David T. Uh, Zhang Professor of the Practice of Law at Duke University and Faculty Director of the Global Financial Market Center. Um, he has been working at Duke for several years and before that he uh, has been working at Wachovia and in many different capacities uh, in the banking sector. And uh, he brings uh, 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 a lot of expertise in regulations and he will talk more about that. And uh, he's the uh, author of numerous scholarly and industry works on regulation, financial services and technology. He received his LLB and BCom business from the University of Natal in uh, South Africa and their PhD in law and government regulation. Uh, he received also his diploma in legal studies and LLM, uh, University of Cambridge. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here today. And uh, uh, thank you very much you for that. Do you want to come here? Uh, oh, no, you can do it from that. I'm happy to do yeah, it. Sure. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I gave him the challenge of drawing attendance that would match John Bolton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys being here. Unlike him, I do not have a book this year. Um, I'm sorry to have taken my suit coat off. It's a little hot. If it gets a little hotter, I'm going to be the first central banker ever to take off his tie. <laughs> So our topic today is challenges in monetary policy. Um, uh, the timing is appropriate because the Fed, and this is all very public, is in the middle of a review of our monetary policy framework. In other words, we have a constitutional document, if you will, that lays out how we think about monetary policy. And we're in the middle of a year-long process to try to review that, update it, and think about how today uh, is different. Um, I don't speak for anyone other than myself here. I don't speak for my colleagues in the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve System. That gives me the freedom to say as much as uh, I want. It's also true that I spent 30 years in the private sector before pivoting to go into the public sector. So my perspective may be a little bit different. But I thought I'd give you uh, one man's perspectives in the hope that when we get to the discussion part, you know, we'll learn from our discussants. Um, I also want to humbly recognize my law school classmate, Sarah who was on the committee when our current framework was documented in 2012. So I'll mention some ideas and some issues, uh, but I think we have to give uh, our predecessors credit here. Um, since that time, monetary policy has worked pretty well against our dual mandate. The unemployment rate is at 50-year lows. Inflation is basically at our target. In fact, if we reported without decimal points, it would be. But we're not complacent, and so I think there are always things we can do better, and that's a little about what I'll talk about. Three issues on, um, on my mind as we start this review. Uh, first, interest rates are a lot lower uh, than they've been historically. We're pretty close to zero uh, at about 1.6%. Uh, and that does call into question whether we'll have the tools we need the next time there's a downturn. Um, typically, we'll lower rates four or 500 basis points. Today, if you want to lower rates from 160, you've only got about 160 uh, basis points. So you've got less room to move uh, to lower rates when they're already low. In addition, the yield curve is pretty flat. That means that long-term rates are basically not much higher than short-term rates. And so unconventional policies, which try to put pressure on longer-term rates, such as forward guidance or quantitative easing, may have less impact when longer-term rates are already low. I'll note, though, that Chair Bernanke, who did a pretty good job the last time, has made the case he believes if we pull these rates in full, there's still four or five equivalent uh, points of impact available. And then I'll talk about it in a second, but I, I would make the case that other countries' innovations, such as negative rates, 
don't seem at first glance to have had compelling levels of impact. So issue number one is rates are pretty low, the yield curve is pretty flat. Second issue is though, while we're close, as I said, inflation has been persistently below 2%, which is our target. In fact, it seems pretty unresponsive to the strength of the economy and perhaps as a consequence to lowering interest rates. Now, that's something that we might celebrate as success because our objective was to anchor inflation and anchor inflation expectations around 2%. And so that's what we're shooting for. On the other hand, there are structural headwinds out there, global competition, increased price transparency, for example, online, uh, technological innovation, and purchasing power of big retailers that may be a headwind to inflation. So the current underrun in inflation does raise risks that expectations will eventually become anchored somewhat below our target, and that would make inflation itself a little more difficult to nudge up. Third thing that at least I worry about is that financial market participants and perhaps business people and perhaps actors in the government seem overfocused on the Fed as the only game in town. This could be risky if in fact our tools have less impact than the economy might need in the event of a shock or a downturn. So if those are three issues that at least I worry about, uh, what are the options on the table to try to address those issues? Well, one thing we've been talking about are a set of different monetary policy tools, such as makeup strategies or negative interest rates. Now, a makeup strategy, uh, which I'll just explain, is a commitment to keep rates low until inflation finally gets to the point that you want it to get to, um, and maybe even overshoots to make up for past misses. Uh, works beautifully in models. Uh, I have to say it makes me a little nervous in practice. You know, I'm certainly wary of any strategy that commits to taking actions in the future. Will the strategies be understood? Can we trust that future policymakers will follow commitments made by their predecessors, in fact? And if not, are we making promises we can't keep? And if we're making those promises, are they going to be credible? All of the models which work so elegantly actually assume that everyone understands them and treats them as fully credible. I just wonder if that's actually going to work. Another idea is negative interest rates. As I suggested earlier, uh, they have little appeal to me. As a communication matter alone, they run the risk as being seen as policy desperation, damaging consumer and business confidence. With due respect to my colleague to the left from Europe, I, I wouldn't make Europe or Japan great reference cases for what's happened. We're the biggest economy in the world. I think you'd want to see tools like this work in other places before you pulled them in here. As a policy matter, they also risk damaging our banking and money market systems, which do differ in important ways from Europe and Japan. And operationally, I just wonder how effective they'll be. Uh, the theory of lowering rates is to stimulate people to pull forward spending from tomorrow. If you think rates are going to be low forever, I just wonder how much pull forward uh, you're going to see. I am, though, convinced that we can act faster and with more commitment using the tools we already have, such as forward guidance and QE. You may remember in the last downturn, we were pretty hesitant to move too aggressively. These were new tools. We feared an outbreak of inflation or financial instability. I think we've learned, in fact, we can act faster and more forcefully. And I'm open to stockpiling, even if we don't use them, a broader suite of tools. Some people have mentioned short duration yield curve control. One thing I think we learned the last time is it's always helpful to bolster expectations by being able to say, for, for the Fed chair to be able to stand up and say, we have one more tool in reserve. One international innovation that I think did really work well was Draghi saying, we'll do whatever it takes. On inflation, I think there's a lot to be said for establishing a target range. First, it moves the discussion away from basis points and over-interpreting every uh, incoming inflation signal. Managing inflation is imprecise, and a range acknowledges that. Uh, second, frankly, it would allow us to introduce a larger number into the conversation. In the 20 years leading up to 2012, uh, we didn't declare a target, um, but we did target, and in fact, we achieved 2% inflation over that time period on a symmetric basis, as we would hope. In 2012, we declared 2% as the target explicitly, and the logic for doing so was grounded in models which suggest that making it explicit would add emphasis to our regime and firm up expectations. But since then, we haven't reached it, except for parts of 2018, despite a very tight labor market and rates consistently below most estimates of neutral. I talked about structural forces that hold inflation down, and, and let me elaborate a little bit on how our point target may itself be playing such a role. So we've declared 2%. 
And I think if you're running a business, that 2% declaration is so credible, it creates a cap in your mind. If a supplier comes in with a 3 or 4 or 5% increase, you say, hey, wait a second, the Fed's very effective at keeping inflation at 2%. I'm going to fight back on that. And in fact, the purchasing teams don't declare 2 as their target. They declare 0 as their target. And so you've got a bunch of very significant purchasers with real market power, think Walmart, right, that are out there trying to drive price increases down. Perhaps on the customer side, you think the same thing. You think someone raising your prices 5 or 6% means you're going to go shop somewhere uh, else. And the combination of those two, I think, creates an asymmetry where increases over 2% are fought back and increases under 2% actually go through. And the average of that could well end up being less than 2% over time. So if you put a range in, in addition to reinforcing you know, the message that this isn't a precise game, it also reinforces our willingness to run over target, perhaps cement a higher number in the minds of businesses and consumers. Most international central banks have a target and a range, and their inflation outcomes aren't worse. In fact, they arguably spend less time under their target. Um, timing is a challenge right now when you've been under target for as long as we've been. To introduce a range makes it look like Maybe you're just trying to come up with an excuse for missing the target. So maybe we don't uh, implement right now, or maybe we declare our intent to implement when we hit 2% on a sustained basis. Or perhaps we adopt an unbalanced range. Think about it if we adopted a range of 2 to 2.5%. You wouldn't be able to say we'd quit on the target. You'd put a higher number in the conversation, and you might actually start to move inflation against these forces. Finally, um, we need to send a clear message that monetary policy is only one of the tools available to policymakers. Uh, doing so, by the way, sends, just sends the right message. You know, we need to message humbly and not create unrealistic expectations about what monetary policy can achieve. It also helps us avoid some of the challenges we faced the last time when state and local constraints and then federal budget pressures arguably limited the impact of our stimulus. Um, and maybe doing so builds more stimulus into the mix. Uh, one of the silver linings of low rates is it gives fiscal policymakers more room to temporarily help in downturns, although we would still need to put ourselves in a path toward long-run deficit reduction. In addition, I think that today we can broaden the definition of government policies that could stimulate the economy beyond what I learned in school, which was you know, tax policy and spending policy. I'd also talk about the climate for business, and by that I mean trade actions, trade uncertainty, regulatory changes and regulatory uncertainty, geopolitical risk, domestic politics. In my view, they've been significant headwinds. But if we could do something to lessen the noise, we could give the government an additional lever, boosting our economy by lessening the uncertainty. Consider, if you will, Brexit. Um, the outcome we're faced with today uh, was greeted enthusiastically by markets. Finally, people know what the rules are going to be, and they're going to act against it. But that path, when it first came out, was seen by the markets and by policymakers as calamitous. Um, it just shows how much potential there is just by clarifying the rules and reducing the uncertainty. So uh, I care about the effect of lower bound and interested in taking the tools we have, using them faster uh, and with more conviction. I care about persistently low inflation and intrigued by the value of a range to try to lift expectations. Um, and I don't think we should be or try to be the only game in town. Thanks. Let me turn it over to Sarah. this around, I guess. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure really to join you today. A heartfelt thanks really to the Duke Center for International and Global Studies, the Duke Global Financial Market Center, and of course the Duke Department of Economics. Um, thank you to President Barkin um, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, uh, Dr. Schubert and the European Central Bank for your perspectives and your presence today. Um, and thank you also to our discussants. So, the topic today really could not be more timely. Um, two of the world's most impressive central banks, the Fed and the ECB, are grappling with a set of realities that are heavy and real and challenging. Despite the fact that on both continents we have avoided a recession, we are all well aware that global demand is weakening. Both the U.S. and Germany face recessionary conditions in their manufacturing sectors. Business investment in the U.S. has been on a downward trajectory for more than a decade. Wages for Americans are virtually flat. 
forcing many people to work several jobs to make ends meet, and consumer demand, while having been generally supportive to economic growth in the past U.S. year, is becoming weighed down by household debt and is starting to show some tears in its usually reliable, strong fabric. At the same time that these macro headwinds present downside risks to global growth, and in fact may be slowing um, and weighing on, sl on slow growth right now, we find that our usual fiscal and monetary and financial stability policy tools are in settings that are not primed for action. They're far from where they should be if we wanted them to be maximally effective. What I mean by this is that the Fed funds rate setting of monetary policy is close to the zero lower bound leaving this tool like a hammer that has only an inch of space away from the head of a nail. Fiscal policy also looks spent, with deficit levels at historic highs in the U.S. The predictions of a tax law that put lower corporate tax rates in place last year have not occurred. Revenues to the Treasury were supposed to increase, but have decreased. Business investment was supposed to take off, but has not materialized in a way that um, would spur growth. And really, all we have to show from the tax legislation in the U.S. are deficit levels that are at all-time highs and strained levels of income and wealth inequality. This makes the use of fiscal policy as a needed, accommodative tool much more challenging as the ability to use fiscal spending to stimulate demand is now in unchartered territory. And then, as if this weren't enough to worry economic policymakers, along come risks that pose threats to financial stability. Now, some of these threats are nothing new, like the rise of leveraged debt to levels never before encountered. But some of these threats are, in fact, very new like the dawning recognition, not in Europe, but certainly here, that climate change is presenting both physical and transition risks. The risks from climate change to financial stability are of a magnitude that present one of the largest headwinds to economic growth, a tap into the abyss of a downturn that could tip into a recession and a full-blown depression. Alas, against this backdrop, there is absolutely no wonder that two of the world's most sophisticated central banks, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, are attempting a rethink and a reset, a means of trying on a different set of lenses to provide new perspectives on the way in which they need to conduct monetary policy in the era ahead. Their question is as basic as whether their old playbooks will do the trick in dealing with these challenges, or instead, whether it's time for new playbooks. This is an ambitious undertaking, as it should well be. The Fed's work, for example, is to convene a set of meetings across the country at the various reserve banks with the goal of bringing to the table people who are hurt, or who thrive by virtue of the Fed's conduct of monetary and financial stability policy. The Fed is calling these sessions the Fed Listens program. These um, efforts are attempting something that perhaps should be done all the time, all along, but now really represent a concerted, deliberate effort to understand what the experience of an American is in this economy today, what it means to live here in this economy now. There can be nothing more potentially valuable to economic policymakers than to see up close what is happening in different settings, in different geographies around the country. The nail salons, the garage sales, the car dealerships, the job fairs, the unemployment center outside of Richmond, Virginia, or on Ocracoke Island after a hurricane, in Baltimore after massive evictions of people have lost their homes. What an extraordinary, extraordinary set of conversations policymakers are part of in seeking to understand the extent to which households and communities bounce back from hardship with a sense of 
irrepressible dynamism, in the words of Banerjee and Duflo. Do they do it with that irrepressible dynamism? Or whether households and communities hang back, worried about how to transition from job to job or region to region. In the US, at least, the Fed likely sees the opportunities in its Fed Listens series to achieve greater clarity and understanding about what lies ahead in terms of the prosperity of our country. And the European Central Bank has announced that it, too, is launching a review of the way it conducts its monetary policy, and by many accounts, is attempting to embrace this review as an opportunity to set the stage for a discussion of how to confront the risks ahead that undermine prosperity. So congratulations to you and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, uh, President Barkin, for participating in these discussions. And congratulations you know, also to Dr. Schubert and your former home, the European Central Bank, for endeavoring a similar launch of discussions. From these extraordinary and ambitious efforts will most certainly come something of sur surpassing value. So Archimedes. Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. In other words, if he could create a lever underneath the earth, perhaps by standing outside it, he could move it. Well, both the Fed and the ECB have the opportunities to stand astride their usual and customary frameworks for conducting monetary policy and take a good look as to what it will take to bring about the results that the people they are listening to seem to be saying. This is the opportunity of the Fed Listens agenda. And so, what might we appropriately expect from such efforts? Just to start with, the credibility of monetary policymakers in general would be enhanced by an honest assessment of the extent to which the current mandates set out by Congress in the case of the Fed and by the EU in the case of the ECB approximate or do not approximate conditions of prosperity. As you all know, the Fed has a dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability. How close does achievement of these two mandates line up with the kind of economy that the Fed is learning about from the people it's talking to across the country in the Fed Listens sessions. I'm willing to concede that even if the Fed were to achieve success in meeting both its mandates, a big if indeed, that that success still may not produce the kind of economy some of us imagine to be ideal. Indeed, we know, for example, that we can have a lot of people working, thereby achieving maximum employment pursuant to that part of the dual mandate, but could still see that such maximum employment means that people aren't necessarily earning enough to pay for their cost of living or to pay their bills without needing to layer up the jobs working both day and night. Some opinion by the Fed of what it thinks it can and can't do within the dual mandate might be a way of responding to the thousands of people who have come out to talk to the Fed about their experiences in this economy. So I wouldn't ignore this step, namely providing an assessment of the adequacy of the current dual mandate in assuring or not assuring the conditions for an economy of the type that the Fed listens, listeners have been listening to. Um, that said, the Fed and the ECB have both been clear that it is not their mandates that are in question, but how to fulfill them. So on the question of how to fulfill them, again, we should expect some boldness in approach to achieving better results than we have seen to date. The prevailing strategy has been to set an explicit target for inflation. In the U.S., that's 2%. The idea behind this explicit inflation targeting is, as President Barkin explained, markets and consumers will know what inflation is likely to be over the medium to long term. But there's been a long-standing problem with this 2% inflation target. Since 2009, the Fed's favorite measure of inflation, which is the personal consumption, the personal consumption expenditure price index, has averaged 1.5%, well below the 2% target. The ECB has fared even worse, 
with its favorite measure, the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices, averaging 1.3% over the decade. There is stubbornly low inflation on both sides of the pond, making it much harder to raise interest rates enough to provide ammunition to fight future recessions. Persistently failing to hit the inflation targets undermines both central banks' credibility. Unfortunately, the consensus view of economists right now seems to be that what the Fed at least is going to bring forward in its new monetary policy framework is still an inflation target, but now one that will explicitly enable the central bank to both undershoot and overshoot an inflation goal. The ECB's process regarding its new monetary policy framework is still early, but importantly, how meaningful is a new inflation targeting approach in a world in which the Fed is not able to even get a bullseye on its inflation goal, let alone overshoot it? Query as to how this approach is anything more than a big nothing burger. A much more productive set of results emerging from this set of discussions would be the exploration of non-inflation targeting strategies as part of a new framework. And here there seems to be a lot to explore. One strategy has been circulating for decades. It's um, known as nominal GDP targeting. You target the sum of inflation and total real output, in other words, to target nominal gross domestic product. With nominal GDP targeting, when output falls and growth needs to be generated, the central bank would automatically lower rates. Lower rates would ease real debt burdens and lower real interest rates, helping to generate growth. And then as output rises, rates would adjust higher to bring inflation down and maintain the nominal GDP target. Another potential tool would be a policy of dual interest rates. In practice, this would mean that the central bank would target different interest rates for loans and deposits. Uh, typically, when a central bank reduces interest rates, we expect this to boost spending in the economy through three basic effects. First, interest rates fall for households with mortgages and credit card debt and student loan debt. Second, asset prices rise, making people feel wealthier. And third, the cost of borrowing for companies falls, which should boost investment spending. But problems emerge when interest rates are particularly low or negative. The interest income, which savers receive, collapses, weighing on spending, and bank profitability is damaged. What would happen if the central bank raised the interest rate on deposits and cut the interest rate on loans? Both savers and borrowers would benefit, and both might stimulate demand. So this strikes me as another possible framework for monetary policy that is worth some discussion. And how, indeed, can we engage in a discussion of a new monetary policy framework without saying something about how it would handle the emergence of major risks to financial stability? The risk of anything that would bring about the possibility of a significant recession or depression directly undermines the Fed's ability to achieve its dual mandate. Hence, any monetary policy framework must explicitly be able to incorporate the possibility of financial risk and the instability that comes from it. This is why central banks look carefully at what financial firms do to defend themselves from the risk of cyber attacks. Similarly, this is why central banks need to be looking carefully at what financial firms do to protect themselves from the physical risks of climate events, the loss in value of real estate collateral, for example, and from the transition risks inherent in moves toward asset classes that are capable of retaining their value in the face of climate events. We would also expect the new monetary policy framework to handle risks to financial stability such as climate change. Again, it's not obvious that a framework consisting of a simple inflation target does the trick here. An inflation target certainly can't take on the risk management practices that the financial sector needs to protect itself from an unpredictable undermining of the value of financial assets.
alas, awaiting both the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank in the evaluations that they have launched are the opportunities to set the stage for a credible monetary policy of the future. The current approaches are overdue for examination, and both the Fed and the ECB are to be commended for their attempt to look ahead. They seem to be listening, and they seem to want to remain credible forces for shaping the resilience of their respective economies. With these evaluations underway, there is a special opportunity to prepare our economies for the risks ahead. And I would assert a special cost to the credibility of central banks if the preparation for such risks is ignored. We look forward to hearing how they make sense of what they're hearing, of what they're witnessing. We look forward to seeing their ultimate boldness in using their significant mandates to alleviate the destructive and destabilizing forces on the horizon. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back to the Carolinas after 35 years, after graduation. And uh, hopefully it was in South Carolina. <laughs> but thanks, thanks to Duke and thanks to Laurie Leachman and to Giovanni for, for inviting me and thinking that I might uh, add something to it. Uh, now we heard already a lot, so I will just uh, add maybe a few points from a European perspective and uh, because the euro area and Europe is, uh, is a little bit, uh, is, is very similar but again a little bit different since uh, as you might know the euro area has 19 different sovereign countries so uh, um, it is a little bit more uh, maybe complicated to get to a consensus. As was mentioned uh, the timing is perfect. Uh, I don't know, uh, I heard that uh, Giovanni scheduled a lecture on financial crisis before Lehman broke, <laughs> uh, just before, and now he scheduled this, uh, and actually three weeks ago the ECB announced uh, the review of its strategy, and uh, just on the 23rd of, of uh, January, so it is very timely, so the, the review was launched by the President uh, Christine Lagarde, and will finish by the end of 2020, so there is here a time lag of about a year relative to the Fed, so everything is very, very, uh, very early on, but the time frame is very, very ambitious. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on the, on the current situation, but uh, at least all the studies show that the policies that have been pursued in the last few years by the ECB, the extremely loose monetary policy, had at least uh, uh, the positive effect on, on growth. Uh, 11 million new jobs were created since the financial crisis. Uh, it's true, as Sarah said, uh, lately the inflation rate has been rather low, 1.3 in the last 10 years. But if you take over the last 20 years since the ECB exists, it was 1.7. It is still uh, below what, what uh, we want to achieve. But also that is uh, about half a percentage point higher than it would have been without uh, the monetary uh, policies. But part of these monetary policies, as it was mentioned, is also to have negative rates, at least uh, for the deposit rate of the central bank, which is currently 0.5% negative, and many of the sovereigns in Europe currently pay negative interest rates on their bonds, uh, not just Germany, Netherlands, uh, Austria, and, uh, and a few other ones. So that is maybe not a normal situation. So that also calls for a, for a review. So that's then the question, why now? It's not just because there is a new president. It's not just, by all due respect, because the Fed is doing it. But uh, the ECB's monetary policy strategy has been from 2003, so it is already 17 years old. Uh, uh, back then, the ECB was only four years old, and a lot has changed since then. We know, first of all, several members have joined the European uh, uh, Monetary Union, which we are not members before. Uh, the, we had the great financial crisis. We had all these unconventional monetary tools which were taken, which are in no textbooks, which we were never teaching, we never thought about them. Uh, there was the famous quote, which uh, we heard before, that whatever it takes by President Draghi in July 2012, which basically saved the uniqueness of the euro area because it made clear that no single country will be kicked out by the market, so to speak, from the, from the euro area. We know it was mentioned, the neutral 
interest rate being very low and falling uh, continuously. Inflationary expectations are also already uh, below 2%. And also, importantly, the ECB has received new tasks since it was created, and the only task back then was monetary policy in 2003. In the meantime, the ECB is in charge of mon uh, financial stability also, and since 2014, November, also for the banking supervision. So these are completely new tasks, which were not here before. We see, just like the Fed and other central banks, the balance sheet has enormously increased uh, since, since those uh, years. And there are new challenges in the horizon, which we just heard before. So the process, at least as uh, Lagarde announced, it will be very comprehensive to look at everything, to turn every stone. Let's see how many can be turned uh, within the short time frame. And there is the idea of having a real dialogue with the, with the stakeholders and not just uh, talking like the last time internally about the, about the strategy. Again, a little bit like, uh, like the, the Fed. So what are the main issues? The one is, as mentioned already, what is the quantitative formulation of price stability? I will come back in a moment because the mandate of the ECB by law is to maintain price stability, full stop. Um, then the question is what is the, the analysis behind it, the prominent role which money has at the moment in the analysis. What is the toolkit which has been enlarged, so that will be something to look at. One thing that is also very important for the Fed is the communication practice, how to communicate with the markets, with the people, and potentially other issues. And if you look at the press release from the 23rd of January, it says also issues of financial stability or environmental sustainability as being issues to be looked at. So uh, the difference is maybe to the Fed to show a little bit uh, what are the differences. I said it's very similar, but there are a few differences. First of all, um, the quantitative definition of 2%, to my knowledge, the Fed has excluded from the review. Mm -hmm. It says this is, has worked and we don't discuss it. In the ECB, it will be discussed and there are already some statements in that. Then there is this prominent role for money, which the ECB has since its beginning, a little bit from the tradition of the Bundesbank. But uh, to my knowledge, the Fed even uh, uh, finished uh, uh, calculating M3 a few years yeah, ago. Many so, years ago. <laughs> so it is a different uh, role of money. Then the environmental sustainability, which is there, which obviously was not in the Fed. Also, the ECB has much more, the instrument box is a little bit wider than the Fed. We'll come back to that later on. Then there are these negative interest rates already, which uh, was mentioned. And as I said, there are 19 national governors uh, talking in addition to the six board members of the ECB. But there are also a few structural differences which are maybe interesting or important. The first one on the mandate. We heard already the Fed has a dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability. The ECB has a single mandate, price stability. And then full stop and then subject to price stability, it has to support the economic policies in the European Union. If you look at that, that's a very wide, uh, very wide thing. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, is pretty unlikely to be changed because that's in the basic treaty. So if you change the treaty, which means all member countries, parliaments would have to agree to it. So that is opening Pandora's box and that's a process of never ending. So that's not, not likely to change. What can change, I think, is at least uh, the communication because currently the communication is extremely focused on the price stability and whether it's 2% or not, and we are, uh, so that, that might change. Then the inflation target currently is not defined as 2% only, but is defined as close to 2% in the medium term. So you have certain things which you can discuss here. First of all, this close to 2%, which some interpret is as non-being symmetric, because it only means basically <laughs> um, from the downside close to 2%. And the other side, what is medium term? This is nowhere defined. So this is also open. So there are these questions like having a band, for instance, where two might be in there, but it might start lower and, and end higher. And uh, also what, is, uh, what could be medium term or could that be redefined as, for instance, the business cycle. So these are some ideas here. And then there is the question, which was also mentioned uh, just before uh, by Tom, is the question of this makeup. So uh, you know, how, how, how do we see, are bygones bygones? So if your inflation rate has been lower for many years, let's forget that. Or do we try to offset this or is there any way to offset it? Which I'm just as skeptical as you are about it, but <laughs> whether policy can pre-commit itself uh, 
um, credibly, which is a, a different thing. So I think um, the two percent is important because it has been, it is in the in the minds of, of everybody. So to give that up, I think would be would be dangerous. But you could be flexible or bending around it and and other things. Higher or lower, there are arguments in both directions. So there are arguments uh, uh, for higher who say exactly to to create more room for more room for the central bank in case. Uh, uh, need it uh, that you can lower really real interest rates if there is the inflation rate is higher so is one argument but there's also the argument uh, to have it lower because two percent have not been achieved so how do you credibly set the the, the, the the target higher and in addition maybe the whole price setting mechanisms with globalization uh, has has changed so the Maybe the whole Phillips curve and all this have changed. So there are, there are arguments in, in both directions. And there is also the question of symmetry, a symmetry which currently is not, not clear, clear in Europe. And some governors interpret it one way, others the other way. So here a clarification is needed. What do we really mean with symmetry and do we want it or not? And then, uh, as I mentioned, I, I had a few years in statistics. So at least one statistical issue is the question, how do we measure inflation, the harmonized index of consumer prices, which Sarah already mentioned. Uh, first of all, is it correctly measured? And there is one big issue, which is owner-occupied housing, which is currently very underrepresented in it. There are a lot of methodological challenges with it, but it's mm -hmm. underrepresented. So if you would add this in, which is usually the place where the people feel inflation the most, um, uh, that, that is an issue. And then the other issue is, should we look at this harmonized index of consumer prices or the underlying, the core inflation, which uh, it takes out the volatile elements like energy, uh, food, where more likely the central bank has no influence on those. Uh, so this is also a question uh, to be discussed. Currently, sometimes this is used, sometimes that is used. Uh, again, not, not, help, not very helpful. And then on the tools, I said there are lots of tools. I don't want to get into the details of the tools, but interest rates was mentioned, uh, negative already. A lot of asset purchases, not just public sector, but also private sector asset purchases, asset-backed securities, but also covered bond purchases. There are then the so-called targeted long-term uh, operations where the banks get cheap uh, liquidity if they give out new loans. So that's a kind of a subsidy to the banks. And then there is the forward guidance. That's the current toolbox that needs to be reviewed. Uh, currently, very often it's mentioned this is a package, but it still needs to be re uh, uh, looked at. And there are some ideas for new tools. For instance, there is currently there are no equity purchases and uh, other, other tools. So what Lagarde said very clearly, she really wants a cost-benefit analysis for all the tools because it's not always clear what are the real effects of the tools if you take them individually or if you take them in their interaction. So here, a uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis, also a potential new tool, uh, will, be, will, will be part of the review. And communication, I think one the big challenge here is maybe there is currently already a lot of uh, you know, press conferences and speeches, but they don't address the general public. They address mm -hmm. expert, experts only. Uh, and here, as uh, so Lagarde has already m said, that she wants to get in a real dialogue with, with stakeholders going far beyond the normal circles. And the other issue, which is also different from the Fed, there is currently no voting and no, no clarity about any voting. And so there is also the issue, should there be voting on important questions? And should that vote then be either published collectively, 5 to whatever, 21, or, should, or 19, or should it be uh, uh, even by name? like the Fed. So these, these are, these are, there are lots of arguments. We don't have time, but if you have questions, uh, what speaks against it or what speaks for, for it? Uh, um, there are a few known positions in the meantime of some governors, although there is an agreement even in the, in the minutes from December not to speak about <laughs> your position. So currently there are very, uh, very few uh, who have mentioned things. One thing is the question of maybe having a band instead of a single number around, around it. So the question of the time horizon was at least uh, identified as an issue that needs to be discussed. There is a governor who has already said the goal should be only one and a half percent. And uh, uh, there is uh, also on the voting already, some, some, some governor has said already there should be a voting and publishing of the votes. And also this issue of owner-occupied housing has already been uh, explicitly identified as an issue that needs to be discussed. But again, there is nothing 
fixed. There were no discussions yet in, in the board, and uh, uh, the, 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 the commitment is to finish this by the end of the year. So to summarize now, the, my first intervention, and I'm sure there will be questions later on, is I think it's the right time for the review due to all these reasons which we mentioned before. It is now a uh, uh, right to do this, and I think one of the goals should be to get closer to the people closer to those affected by monetary policy and also to be more accountable maybe than in the past. And But what is important, I think, is to manage expectations. What can you really expect? Because if you look into the literature, if you look into the media, some people uh, expect the central banks can do everything. We heard the only game in town, as uh, Mohamed El Erian said a few years ago, the ECB was the only game in town, was the quickest institution in Europe, but it cannot do everything. And uh, during the years I was there, we got at least these two new tasks, uh, uh, financial stability, systemic risk board, banking supervision, completely new task. Central bank cannot do everything. And the other side, it's also not true, as many people argue, that the central bank is the source of all the problems and all the evils. So here we need um, expectations management. And at least my take as a, after 35 years in central banking and Having joined Central Bank in the same year as Ken Rogoff wrote his article about the conservative central banker, <laughs> or published it, uh, I think there will not be a revolution, only an evolution. And a lot of it will be at the margins, but we know in economics at the margins it's important. And uh, I think a lot will be also about, about communication and about how to interact uh, with the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for involving me. Thank you, uh, Director Schubert and President Barkin and Governor Raskin for coming from out of town. And in, in the case of Dr. Schubert, a very long way. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. Um, Giovanni doubles both as a colleague and a friend uh, because he's the only person I can turn to to get authentic wisdom on Italian sports cars, uh, yeah. which he's uh, very knowledgeable on. Um, there's a paradox about something we've always prided ourselves in, and that is the independence of the Fed. Uh, and uh, we're already all uh, well-functioning central banks, and that is... Uh, creating it as an independent institution was precisely to protect it from pervading political whims. And yet in, a, in an environment in which our Congress is seemingly paralyzed in a highly uh, polarized situation and an executive <laughs> is uh, not uh, restrained, uh, it must be very frustrating not to be able to express your views publicly whilst certainly knowing that these views are very much uh, in our minds. And I wanted to raise uh, four, uh, it, uh, four risk issues and one productivity issue very uh, quickly, knowing that you cannot speak too uh, loudly about them publicly, but asking you how much of this occupies your mind. So, so you're going to ask questions knowing that we can't answer. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> I think they're for you. Yeah, exactly. yeah. That, 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 yeah. I was trying for a week. I was Monday? trying for a week. Yeah. 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 So the first, uh, the first are the, the four C's of risk mm -hmm. that uh, a couple of them have been alluded to, uh, but all four seem to me to have a very profound emerging risk risk on monetary policy. Um, the first is uh, cyber security that the Fed mm -hmm. has made very clear as a principal issue, and it seems to be a natural outgrowth of protecting the payment system. So that one does not worry me as much, even though I know that cyber security itself is a major issue. Uh, the second is the long-term uh, impact on uh, money uh, brought about by decentralized cryptocurrency. And the Richmond Fed was one of the earliest of the Federal Reserve Banks to put out a study uh, on cryptocurrency, I think way back in 2013. Um, economists are starting to write about the impact that it would have if there is a war between decentralized cryptocurrency and centralized currency in the form that we know it now. <laughs> Uh, and so we've seen that central banks are looking at, and some have already started, Canada, for example, um, looking at issuing digital currency as a centralized <laughs> version that still retains control over monetary policy as opposed to the, the decentralized that may run away from us. Uh, so there's, there's cybersecurity, there's cryptocurrency, uh, 
there is the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, this may seem like a cliche, but it is a serious risk. And I was just reading again today the latest economic assessments on things like productivity uh, losses. Apple yesterday warned that it was going to miss its earnings precisely mm -hmm. because of it. And that's one of these factors that um, reminds me of the first banker I ever worked for when I asked him about risk management and he said, Lawrence, you will never see the lightning that strikes you. These things come out of the blue mm -hmm. and yet it's here now and I'd be very interested to know how much uh, uh, that uh, weighs on your mind. Uh, and then finally, uh, Governor Raskin's already t uh, alluded to this um, climate change. Um, uh, Governor Leo Brainerd gave what I thought was a very sophisticated speech on the subject in San Francisco in November. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's clear that the Fed is starting to become aware of it, but I'm sure that Director uh, General Sch Schubert would say, you know, y the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, uh, the Bank of Paris, uh, of France, are way ahead on this issue. Their analyses are very sophisticated, <coughs> uh, very educational. We have a, 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 an effort by the San Francisco Fed, but it just uh, barely touches the surface. And yet last week there was the Humphrey Hawkins um, uh, uh, presentation uh, before the House of Representatives by um, the chairman of the Fed, and I know you can't speak about that directly, mm -hmm. but it was quite a shock to a class that uh, Governor Raskin and I ran that, that evening. It was a shock to us too. The last question asked was by Representative Castens, a junior um, a member of Congress, about climate change, and it looked to me as if Chairman Powell had never thought of the subject in his life. Now, that's not possible because he's a very able person, but it was floundering, and it made us a little embarrassed, to be honest, about the Fed's awareness of the scale of this threat. So. Those are the, the four risk issues. And then lastly, um, on productivity, um, as a former McKinsey person, what I've welcomed, uh, President Barkin, is your business perspective. It's really, mm -hmm. it, it rings through in everything that you say and, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of brings, uh, to my mind, a behavioral economics that is more realistic than one has normally defined in, in speeches by people from the Fed. Um, but one thing that seems to me to have been constantly underestimated uh, is the productivity gain to which you alluded to from technology. Uh, and it has, it's a double-edged sword. The, I think that one of the reasons for our growingly bitter and angry polarization is the impact of technology. And I remember seeing it firsthand when I saw the people we laid off because the internet arrived. It made a huge difference. But when I read the studies about productivity gains, they don't seem to be nearly, they're cautious, as they should be, but they don't seem to get it, that our whole world has turned upside down in the space of 15 to 20 years, far more than we re recognize. And I don't see that being factored in as much as I would feel more comfortable with, with uh, the fair assessments of productivity and perhaps a, a major reason for the persistent low inflation. So risks and productivity gains, and I'd really put them off. to all of you. <laughs> okay, so you've asked about cyber, cryptocurrency, coronavirus, climate change, and productivity. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. In 20 Two seconds. Hours. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll split it into a few things, uh, and then others, you know, likely have points of view on this. Um, uh, first of all, it's been 50 years since the U.S. economy sort of slowly drifted into a recession. Right? When we usually have a recession is uh, sometimes if the Fed lifts rates quickly, but more frequently financial stability, as you know, Sarah was saying earlier, whether that's the market drop in uh, 2001 or the financial crisis, the savings and loan crisis in the 90s, uh, an external shock, uh, think terrorism 9-11, think oil price spikes uh, in the 70s. And so I think when we think about the question I get the most, which is, it's been 11 years of a record upturn in the U.S., when's the downturn coming? People expect you to be able to predict some, I think you have to look hard at shocks. And so you mentioned many shocks uh, that I actually worry quite a lot about. Um, cyber, uh, imagine for a second the Iranians or the North Koreans taking out the electrical grid, the banking system, uh, the transportation system. It's easy to imagine the impact that would have on uh, consumer confidence, business confidence, uh, and the like. Coronavirus, uh, there's a conversation about what it does to China, there's a conversation about what it does to supply chains, but just imagine for a second a pandemic, and we're not leaving our rooms, we're not, you know, 
uh, were effectively stuck on that cruise ship. And that would be a massive uh, shock. And of course, you know, the secondary implications of a major climate event that could happen, you know, could be a major disaster. Think of what, you know, the tsunami did to Japan. You know, we certainly see it in smaller areas and hurricanes and others. And, and so there's a lot that could happen on the shock side. And I think one of the challenges we've got is <coughs> stewarding an economy while being aware of shocks. Uh, and of course, there's always five you haven't thought of. So I just, I think shocks are a huge issue and you're right to uh, point them out. Um, on the uh, cryptocurrency side and maybe separately mentioned on the climate change side, uh, I do think, certainly Jay is well aware of it, as are the rest of the Federal Reserve System. And there are places we're focusing. You mentioned uh, uh, San Francisco did a climate conference. We've got a researcher in, uh, in Richmond, Juan Fan, who's done a lot of great work on that. We're actually hosting our own conference sometime this fall um, because we're trying to bring out the question of how do we have, how do we respond, act, lead as a central bank in a world where our mandate is somewhat constrained. And I think Sarah was right, and it is constrained against a lot of these uh, things. I do think one place that's an unequivocal place you can play is in the financial stability side of the house. We do have authority for financial, for oversight of financial institutions. Uh, a good example, I was with uh, somebody a few months ago uh, who was taking me through uh, the current 100-year flood maps. For those of you who've bought houses, uh, anytime soon, you know, you think you have to get flood insurance if you're in the 100-year floodplain, except the 100-year floodplain is not the same thing as how places that have flooded in the last 100 years. In fact, there's been a lot of influencers on those maps, which suggests that maybe 40, 50 percent of the homes that ought to be in there are covered. And so, you know, uh, we've got banks that are giving mortgages. We've got, uh, frankly and sadly, low-income people, for the most part, living in places without flood insurance. I think from an oversight perspective, those are places uh, you can go as well. Um, maybe I'll jump to uh, a, a cryptocurrency. I mean, everybody's doing a lot of research uh, in that. Um, I, I would point out, we actually do have a digital currency today. It's called the US dollar. I mean, I have about $100 in my pocket for any of you who are interested in going out afterwards. Um, I have a lot more money in a bank account, and it's all accessed digitally. Um, and so, you know, when you go into digital currencies for the U.S., it's very different if you're in Argentina or Turkey where you need a stable source of value, or you're in China where, you know, perhaps the government has an interest in tracking transactions. Um, in this country, if you want a digital currency, you actually have it. So the question is, where's the added value to a central bank-enabled digital currency? Could be the effectively deposit insurance. Uh, could be to help the unbanked, though Venmo and other apps also help the unbanked. So you just got to think hard about where's the value added, and that's what we're trying to dig into. And certainly in Richmond, where we've got the IT organization for the Fed, is where we're uh, digging in. Uh, and then productivity. So, uh, you know, I spent 30 years helping companies uh, improve their productivity. And at least my memory is I was very effective. And so uh, I don't know how to think about a set of metrics that show that the U.S. economy as a whole, um, after a very strong productivity period in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, has slowed meaningfully. And so like anybody else, I first decided the metrics were wrong. But then I dug into them, and they're not, they're not horrible. Um, a, a lot of folks say, you know, artificial intelligence is coming, it's right around the corner, and as soon as that plugs in, it's going to be productivity city. Um, you know, I, I go to two or three things that I've figured out that are interesting to me as we measure productivity across the economy. Uh, one of them is startups are a great source of productivity in this economy. The startup rate in this country has dropped by well over half in the last uh, 20 years. Um, that's an interesting fact, and there are a lot of reasons one could speculate behind it. Uh, the rise of technology and the technology you need to start it, uh, perhaps regulation and what that's done to startup rates. Uh, the fact that we're at very low unemployment, at least traditionally a lot of startups are caused by folks who don't have jobs, uh, maybe a drop in immigration. There's a lot of reasons you could come to. But if you've got a lot fewer startups, maybe that has something to do with productivity. At the same time, uh, big companies um, are investing a much smaller part of their profits or their market cap um, in the future than they used to. And that could be R&D, that could be capital expenditures. And again, if you believe that investment has something to do with 
productivity. You might ask why that's the case. Hangover from the Great Recession, uh, short-termism uh, by senior folks in, uh, in companies, um, uh, the economic benefits of returning capital to shareholders versus um, investing them back in the business, the growth of uh, private shareholders who perhaps drive that. There's a lot of things going on in that, but that's a second place, place that I love. And then the third place, which is interesting, is that uh, exit rates uh, in most parts of the economy have dropped meaningfully uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, which is also surprising because you think in a world of dynamic competition. But, you know, low interest rates. Um, there's a lot of talk in Europe about, they call them zombie companies, but companies that are, you know, hanging on. And so, uh, you know, if you don't have the low productivity firms exiting, you also have to ask the question of what that does to the average statistics. So all those are places that uh, we're researching and interested in. And now, that was a lot of answers to a lot of questions. I'll turn it back to my colleagues. So a couple, yeah, let me, a couple, of, uh, a couple of reactions to what has been said. Uh, you know, I, I completely agree you know, that we're, we're unlikely to slip into a recession. Um, I think that that's probably not exactly the frame that um, I think about. I think more um, about the fact that we are in low growth that we are so, you know, we're, we're in the airplane and it's very close to the ground. So that the magnitude mm -hmm. of an exogenous shock really doesn't have to be that great mm -hmm. to do something that would um, potentially be destabilizing. Um, on climate change, and I love, all, I love the four C's and the P. Mm -hmm. That's like a, yeah, but just on, on, on climate change. If it was change, three C's and a P, we'd be in a different <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I think, um, yes, you know, I don't, I don't think that the way to look at climate change is as a shock. I think one of the things we've learned from the way the Europeans are approaching uh, the climate change debate as it pertains to financial stability is that it's not the shock that is, um, you know, that, that presents all the risks. It's how, in essence, the valuation of assets is going to move through a planet that is getting, that is going to be two degrees warmer soon. Also the response of governments and other institutions to that warmth, right, could That's lead to right. valuation pressures as well. That's could be right. Misvalued right, that. right. So, um, the, I, so I think we, if we put it in the shock kind of category, <laughs> we're going to miss out mm -hmm. on actually looking at this um, in a proactive way as a risk management tool. Um, and I think you're right, too, Tom, to, um, to say that it does, it, it does fit within the financial stability mandate. I am not here talking, certainly from the U.S. perspective, on necessarily green QE or, or as a monetary policy per se tool. I think there's a lot that can be done from the financial stability perspective. By the way, I would also argue that financial stability is part of the dual mandate because, of course, if you lose financial stability, mm -hmm. you're going to, in essence, you're, you're going to have not big spikes in on, you're not going to meet the mandate. So, but um, I think the, um, the way to go about doing this um, is to start with the question of asking whether markets are appropriately taking into account the devaluation of particular assets mm -hmm. that are carbon-based, okay? What are the market mechanisms that could be, um, you know, that could, that could come into play are they coming into play? If not, why not? So there's a, there's a, there, the, this, this topic shouldn't be one that the Fed shies away from. It's mm -hmm. got to be one that I think is, um, can be taken on step by step, um, which is in essence how they did it with, you know, cybersecurity, a whole different C, a different kind of, a different kind of um, risk but one that I thought um, was done in a, you know, in a quite mm -hmm. uh, concerted way, convened people to, beginning, to begin talking about this, didn't step in with regulation immediately, but was and, in essence, a, there was much, a discussion. Still much more to do. And still much more to do. So I think, I think the, the climate change uh, risk to financial stability, I think there's a way forward on this. Thank you, yes. Uh, Talking about timeliness, also exactly this morning, the, the OMFIF, the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum in London, published a report which is called Tackling Climatic, Ch Climatic Change, the Role of Banking Regulation and Supervision. And so I used this morning to, to read through it. 
Uh, and, uh, and what is maybe interesting just to mention that 70% of the central banks and regulators who participated share the view that uh, uh, climatic change is a major threat to financial stability, just as it was said before. So 70% and 55% are already monitoring the risks. And, uh, but the thing uh, which is criticized is uh, basically two things. First of all, that the regulatory frameworks as very often are fragmented. Everybody thinks to go his or her own way. And that there is an enormous, it leads back to my previous job, lack of data uh, in that area. And, uh, and uh, th these are the key challenges. And it's also interesting that 79% of the central banks and supervisors say they will include uh, climatic risks into their stress tests uh, as, uh, as quickly as possible. And, uh, but also interesting, coming back to monetary policy, that 42% see at least that monetary policy has a role to support climatic, the climate, climate agenda not necessarily to, to solve it, but at least to support, because uh, climate change will have also in the long run potentially, as we could call it, a stagflationary shock. Mm -hmm. Those who are old enough remember what that uh, used to be, because you will have supply side shock, supply mm -hmm. side effects, uh, obviously on, on those who are on the wrong side of, the, of, of, of industry, mm -hmm. but also demand side effects, so both price and quantity effects will be here. So in that sense, it's relevant for monetary policy, and this. Lagarde also says usually that we have to take it into account in all our forecasts before we set monetary policy. We have also to take this into account. And it will have effects on also on the inflation target discussion because if you have this transition, you will have to have large relative price adjustments between, let's say, the brown and the green economies. And if you, if you have very low inflation rates, then relative price adjustments, as you know, is, is very difficult, mm -hmm. if especially if you have a... Uh, that, um, yes, uh, not moving prices or not moving only only moving in one direction. So in that sense, it's also uh, relevant uh, for price stability. And so, central banks have to uh, start to deal with this. And uh, and I actually, uh, it, it's in the report. I can only report it about the report that actually the ECB has of done, for instance, a study under the vulnerability of the German economy. Uh, to the physical risks of climate change, for instance, bottlenecks on the rivers, because you know, <laughs> if you don't have enough water in the rivers, so this has a lot of uh, supply chain effects. And the Bank of Canada has already started to look at the effects on forestry, on the effects on agriculture and, and mining in Canada uh, when with, with the climate change. So this is something which is relevant. And for that purpose, it's also good that Central banks and supervisors have created a network of, uh, for the greening of the financial system, which are currently more than 50 central banks and supervisory authorities are participating around the world, and which are really looking at these effects and these uh, things and how to react again in a coordinated way. And unfortunately, the Fed is not yet a member. But at least to my recollection in the last press conference was mm -hmm. the last question to Jay Powell and he said yes, but we will soon join. <laughs> so yeah, at least he like, must have they didn't like that answer. He must have uh, dealt with the issue, otherwise go, he wouldn't right? have said we will soon yeah. join. Uh, because currently from the US only the New York uh, mm -hmm. financial supervisor, sorry, I don't know the exact expression, they they joined it and and the Bank of Canada obviously from from North America. So in that sense I think uh, and I don't want to add now more as time is moving, but financial stability, there is a lot to be done there. Uh, if you think about, and, and maybe there are three things. The one thing is the monitoring. So for that, you need data, but you also need, before you start collecting data, you need standardization, you need uh, taxonomy. And Europe, the European Commission has developed, it's not yet approved, the taxonomy. So what is green? What is a green investment? Mm -hmm. What is a brown investment, or as I learned yesterday on the YouTube, what is an olive investment, which yeah. is <laughs> in between <laughs> brown and, uh, and green. So, so you need a taxonomy, so we're talking about the same things, because if you then force the banks to maybe put up more capital to certain investments, y you don't want to do this everybody on his own, and the Banque de France did it differently from the Fed, and then, then you have an uneven uh, treatment of, of banks in the same markets. Then once you uh, uh, has the disclosure and the data, then the question is the risk identification, which is the stress testing where it's important. And once you identify the risk, is the question of the risk mitigation. And that leads then to the questions of capital buffers, additional capital buffers, et cetera. And, uh, and here, so there is, there is a lot, of, lot, of, uh, lot uh, to be done here. Uh, and also in the monetary policy, at least, we all have 
more maybe more the, the Europeans who don't have this, a corporate bonds, for instance, in the portfolio. So in the rating of those things, this should play a role. If you have a, a purely brown, carbon-dependent um, corporate bond, uh, it will uh, should have a different rating uh, uh, than, than otherwise. So in the collateral framework, um, in your own portfolio, the ECB, for instance, is pension fund, uh, which hopefully performs well, because I depend to a certain extent on it, um, uh, has, has, has committed to go green and only uh, uh, allow a green investment, whatever this is, but also in, in, in the foreign reserve. So, so in that sense, uh, important, but once you get to monetary policy, I think what's always important, and, and Sarah mentioned this, this key word of green QE, there I'm a little bit more... Uh, uh, maybe more skeptical, but what is important here that the ECB or any central bank uh, stays market neutral and does not uh, go beyond its 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 mandate, which which uh, maybe is, is is somewhere else uh, in in my view. Uh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to open the first question. So, please. So I'm especially interested in the problem of measurement, and um, I think that's really key. Um, yeah, there's no inflation if you look at the things that are affected by globalization and automation. But if you look at services, if you look at equity prices, if you look at the medical sector in particular in this country, I don't know what it's like in Europe, um, if you look at dentistry, if you look at some services like even uh, lawn care, um, plumbing and electricians, um, mm -hmm. they're getting more expensive because they're getting more scarce. Um, all these things are, are um, have been going up in price quite a bit more than the CPI measures. Um, and as someone who's about to collect Social Security, I can tell you that um, the raises in Social Security come nowhere close to actually dealing with the prices that senior citizens um, face. As I was prepping for this conversation at Duke, I was expecting a Social Security question. So for those who aren't as close as you are, there are lots of metrics of inflation. Uh, we chose to choose the PCE, which many people at that time thought was a good measure of inflation. There are many other infl uh, measures. The CPI, which is reported actually runs 40 basis points or so higher than the PCE. Um, for your question, I think a really good measure is the Dallas trimmed mean, which I'll oversimplify. It takes the top quarter out and the bottom quarter out in any given period of time and just focuses on the 2575. And that's been running right at 2%. So there are things that run higher than 2%. Healthcare would be a great example. There are things that run lower than 2%. Consumer goods would be a great example. My best take, if you took out the top quarter and you took out the bottom quarter and you did the middle, it is around two. That there, mm -hmm. And then where we're stuck, bad word probably, where we're challenged is we set our target to hit a PCE of two. And that implies that we're under and we need to do as best we can to do a little bit more, even though different measures would say that. So I mean, you could come back to the metrics as you know uh, we were talking about in Europe. But th that's, I think, the challenge we've got. So for sure, the Fed funds rate is 160. Uh, you know, a lot of corporates are borrowing in the, you know, high twos and threes. Uh, um, mortgages right now are in the threes. Auto loans are a little higher. Don't do a credit card loan, but credit card loans are a lot higher. So there's lots of different rates. And, and for sure, if we lower our rates, uh, whatever, another 10, 20, 160 basis points, those rates would come down, you know, somewhat. Um, there's then another piece to it, which is uh, rates of different duration that are matching it. So if you bring the long rates down, the 
30 year is somewhere in the 3% range. So if long rates came down, which is part of what we were trying to do with quantitative easing, then those rates would come down uh, too. I think the challenge is we don't have the tool of moving the prime rate or the, you know, we have the tool of moving the Fed funds rate. And so uh, if you move that down, you move other rates down. And then you have the issue that I talked about earlier of negative interest rates, which they've tried in Europe and in Japan. So, yeah, there's definitely still a, a loan rate out there. You know, and your observation's a good one because the rates don't all move together at the same time or have, you know, <coughs> usually in the same direction. But it's, it, there's a, there are two kind of other sort of aspects to your question. One, in terms of savers and what people mm -hmm. earn at their banks, right? Those rates are abysmally low, right? But they tend to not match the Fed funds rate. They are slow to react to Fed funds changes. That's one thing to remember. The other thing is on student loan debt, of course, the rates there are set in a, in a way that has nothing to do with, very little to do with what the Fed funds rate is. So um, your, your question, and actually the prior question, really points to this issue of, of what the real impact is of living, you know, the cost of living, what interest rates really, you know, how they actually affect people who go about, you know, trying to prosper. And getting the measures right, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the Fed really likes to have measures that it can hit, you know, but on the other hand, if these measures have no, bear no relationship to what it really means to be an American trying to make a living, query as to whether it's particularly relevant. And I think also your question about, you know, how and how rates move in relationship to the Fed funds rate. As Tom points out, there's one tool, I mean, there's basically one tool, right? It's the Fed funds rate. They, the, the Fed can't really touch other kinds of rates. And they just hope that when they make their move on the mm -hmm. Fed fund side, that it has a kind of ripple effect into other credit markets. <clears throat> yeah, um, I also wanted to thank you guys for coming. I really enjoyed the panel. My name's Nick Hill. Um, I'm an undergrad here, and I was wondering what, what you think if you think central banks are looking at, or rather should they look at, I guess, neutral rate estimates, I know Laubach Williams is at like 1%, Olson Laubach Williams for advanced economies is almost zero. So is that something central banks should be looking at, or is it something that they are looking at? I, I think looking at very seriously. I've, I've been part of, part of the, I think the whole premise of our review, and I trust <coughs> your review, is neutral rates by all accounts are significantly lower than they were before, which means that our rates are going to end up lower. Uh, at the start of a situation, and so how do we handle that? So ab absolutely. Yeah. If I just uh, may add um, that I think, uh, but there is also a challenge uh, potentially to to address the fundamental issues why they are so low, and so that's why, for instance, if you look at the press uh, conferences of the ECB president at the end, there is always this call for structural reforms, etc., in order to to increase our um, uh, potential growth, so questions like like innovation, education, research, uh, et cetera, maybe also uh, reducing some uh, regulation, unnecessary regulation, in order to uh, raise productivity. That is the call, in order exactly to, to maybe stop or, or, or mm -hmm. slow down this, 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 this trend, which uh, creates then additional problems for monetary policy. Yes. Sorry, I will call two questions, so please. Okay. One on climate change and the other on uh, accessibility. When it comes to climate change, it seems to me that it is possible that we are mixing two different things. That is the warm-up of the uh, planet and also uh, the unsustainable use of our resources. Just because it is possible that uh, the warming up of the planet Earth, it's not, uh, it, 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 uh, it comes also because of the solar cycles, because other planets, if you read some NASA reports and other reports, some other uh, findings, that other planets at the same time are also warming uh, simultaneously away with the Earth, and this, of course, does not justify the way we are treating our resources and the way we have trashed our planet. And second, a comment on excess liquidity. Um, as we know, excess liquidity is now an issue after, since the onset of the global financial crisis, it has reached uh, in, in billions or more than 14% of GDP in the Eurozone, and it is much more higher in US, but at least in terms of Euro Eurozone, from what I read, it is more being talked about. How much are you taking into account the phenomenon of excess liquidity in the new monetary policy framework as a sort of, because it, prevent somehow the pass-through from policy rate to other interest rates in the market. 
Yeah, yeah, I am actually, I did not mean to imply in any way that this, that what I'm talking about is a new monetary policy, is, is part of that new monetary theory. theory. That is not what this <laughs> is at all. And, and this exercise, I don't think, is going to lead us into new monetary policy theory um, kind of discussions. And for the sake of the audience, this is, there is a, a theory that um, I I don't think I'm even qualified to articulate, but it is one that is very, um, very heavily dependent on deficit financing, um, almost without limit, it appears, um, in terms of being able to bring about growth. That's a, um, that is not what this discussion is about. The, the term, you know, the use of this, the frameworks that are being discussed are frameworks that are being discussed within the context of the current mandates that the central banks have been given by their legislative bodies. Um, you make a good point on climate change that, you know, it's not just our planet. Unfortunately, this is the planet that we are living on now and we're going to have to um, kind of deal with, deal with it, as well as the heat in this room. I guess. Yeah. We, don't to, okay. we don't want to use too much energy, so yeah. that is why. There we go. That's all there we go. Yeah. But um, I think that the, um, that they're, you know, the, the, the costs that are now um, racking up in terms of um, <coughs> the effects of, uh, the, of climate change are really getting to be at a point that something is going to need to get done. So it's, it's pretty astonishing when you um, start to measure what the costs are of the warming planet. And we don't even have to get into, you know, the science, you know, sort of all the science behind it to know that there is this risk and the costs are climbing. So that alone is, I think, enough to justify some kind of inquiry. And on the excess liquidity question, I'm not positive which of two things you might be talking about, so I'll try to answer both. Um, banks have a lot more liquidity today than they used to, uh, cash, treasuries, reserves. That's pretty intentional on our part. We've put in place a regulatory regime that has said to the banks, we want you to have the resources to handle a run on the bank in a much more fundamental way than 10, 11 years ago. And so uh, we've done that. Uh, we're certainly in the world of trying to sort through how to optimize monetary policy in the context of that liquidity, but I don't think we complain about that liquidity. I think we did that quite intentionally. You could be saying, back to the last question, um, you know, demographics have changed, so you've got a lot more savers and a lot less spenders, and so that's put excess liquidity and lowered the neutral rate. And if that's what you're talking about, I think that just refer back to the last question, very serious issue and one that we're, we're uh, trying to manage against. And just very briefly, and um, yeah, we are not climatologists here, but I think what we have to deal with is, is with, the, with the consequences. And uh, just last Thursday, Friday to Sunday, I was skiing, or supposedly skiing, <laughs> and uh, part of Austria. And okay, there was there was a, a wide slope, but around left and right, everything was brown and green. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was with artificial snow, and uh, uh, which they could produce only because overnight it was at least uh, below zero. But if that's even gone, then you so there there are real effects which one has to deal it, with because it behind that you have banks. As well, as <laughs> <else>. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, who is the bank who is uh, giving the loans to those who are running uh, the, the lift and, and and the hotels there? So so we have to deal. Whatever might be the reasons, but we have to deal with uh, with the consequences uh, where it becomes relevant for financial stability. For Just one more, I think that. Sure. Uh, about monetary policy tools, you mentioned for guidance and QE, which by now are more conventional than unconventional tools. Uh, I'd like to ask you what you think about helicopter money, <laughs> if it's effective. First of all, and second, if it's within the Fed's and the ECB's legal authority to do it. I'm, I'm free to talk. <laughs> no constraint. Uh, no, I mean that's. Uh, um, I mean, what does it mean? It means giving money to the households directly or to enterprises without going through the financial market. So it's de facto, it, it's not monetary policy, it's, it's fiscal policy. So you're, you're yes, distributing uh, something. So it's, it's not a question for the central bank, whatever you call it. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a, that's a no-go no in that respect. And, and 
you could be trying to solve one of two problems. You could be trying to solve uh, a deep downturn, right? In which case, it's fiscal policy. If you're trying to do it to solve inflation somewhat under target, you will get more inflation. Uh, whether you think you can calibrate helicopter money to exactly get from 1.7 to 2 percent, I'm pretty skeptical. Okay, so thank you very much, and thank you also for the audience. Thank you.